bless you. Um, our church is growing. And I told Brother Charlie a few minutes ago if he would check with Diane to make sure that we have enough cups prepared and so on and so forth. And so I think that we're, we're covered for this this morning. Now, uh, Jesus, in chapter 5 of John, multiplied the fish and the bread to feed 5,000 people, and we know the story. And that's the physical bread, which we have in the fellowship hall. Don't let Daryl go first. There may, not, there, may, there may not be enough food left. Time is done. But anyway, but in chapter 6, he says... I fed you the real, the natural bread and the fish, but if you really want to eat bread, real bread, you're going to eat of my flesh and yes. of my yes. bread. Amen. Amen. And unless you do that, right. you have no life in you. So our church is growing, and we're we're very thrilled about that. We're happy uh, to see growth, but the most important growth to witness in any church is the individual person as they mature in Christ, as they grow in the stature and the measure of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Numbers do not necessarily always reflect that God is working in That's people's right. lives. Right. Right. There's, 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 there's no question about that. I mean, the Moonies are still growing. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are growing. The Mormons are growing. And so that does not necessarily compute to God doing that. How many know that the Bible says in the last days people have itching ears and they'll gather to themselves men and women's going to teach them and speak to them the things they want to hear. Right. And we well, I know of a number of pastors right here in the Midlands that were fired by their boards because they were preaching the word and not what they wanted to hear. Yeah. That goes to show you how bad off the church is. Uh when you preach the truth in the church and the church kicks you out, that tells you that Jesus was kicked out a long time ago. Yes. 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 That's right. Preach a pastor. Amen. <coughs> There's been no Jesus in that church a long time. That's right. Because they don't want the truth. And when the truth comes forward, they kick the preacher out. Amen. Uh, that, that, I mentioned a moment ago, that shows clearly that Jesus was put out long before the preacher was. Because right. yeah. they won't receive sound doctrine in the last days. Right. They, won't, they won't hear sound doctrine. They want to tolerate it. But they're in the church. How, how ludicrous is that? We want Jesus, but not his instruction. We want Jesus' eternal life and all the feel-good stuff, but we don't want to follow him. Jesus said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Right. And Jesus clearly said, not all those who call me Lord That's right. That's right. are mine or they really follow me. That's right. So today, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, you know, I, for the last several years now, I used to be more <clears throat> pulpit-oriented in my preaching. I, I used to <laughs> somehow years ago I got unshackled. Amen. <laughs> Set free. <laughs> and that's a good thing. I mean, I'm not saying you're wrong with that. It's a pulpit. It's it's the holy desk. What I call a holy desk, of, uh, where where the holy word of word is, word is preached from. But. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not trying to prove anything to anyone. It's just that when I preach the word I preach, expository preaching, I preach an expository style. That is to say, I, 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 I take the word and I break it down to where you can take it in small chunks and not choke on a big chunk so that you can receive it and apply it to your life and say, hey, that fits right there, that fits here, and that fits down here, that here, that fits here, and then all of a sudden you feel that God has done something in your life. Amen. So I'd like for you to, back there, if you can, Gary, find me uh, Isaiah chapter 6, beginning of verse 1 again. Uh, because, Pastor Stephan, I feel like he's, yeah, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 6, 7, 8, something like that. 
is probably, as far as Calvary Community Church is concerned, and the communion, probably this portion of Scripture stands out at, as its fundamental foundation. And, and, and the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. <laughs> How many want to see Jesus? Amen. We want to see Jesus. You better get used to him because when you get to heaven, guess what? That's all you're going to see. If you don't like him down here, what makes you think you're going to like him there? Amen. And if you don't like him here, I don't think you might see him there. Right. Your chances are drastically reduced Amen. of seeing him there if you don't want him here. Right. Amen. The Bible speaks of those who look for his coming. Here at Calvary Community Church, this pastoral staff, these men of God must see Christ high and lifted up yes. in His train by the rope, filling the temple. Yes. For unless the Lord build a house, they labor in vain who build it. Amen. We do not want to have the outside world be impressed on a fall in false impression that we're alive and we're not. Amen. Amen. We want to be alive not only by reputation, but we want to be alive in reality that we and Christ are one in the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Now, let me, let me read down a little bit. The, the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. It, 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 would you agree with me that that is where every church needs to be at? Yes. Yes. I saw the Lord high lifted up sitting on a throne. And unless Jesus is sitting on a throne, you will not honor and respect him and revere him. You're not going to fear him nor his authority, nor for you're not going to how many know that when you talk in terms of thrones, it is the the, the consummate expression of authority. Yes. A throne speaks of consummate authority. If we don't see Christ on a throne, authority was out the door. Right. If you see Christ as your buddy, 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 <laughs> authority goes. Right. Yes, he is a compassionate Savior that puts his arm around us. Yes, he is a compassionate Lord that does not require more of us than he gives us also grace to handle. But we must see him on a throne of authority, the throne of glory and power. Here's the thing. If you will see Christ as the authority, as Lord of your life, yes. He will not only be Lord of your life, but He also lords over your problems. Amen. 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 I mean, when I give my heart to the Lord, I give my life to Him, I gave all my problems to Him too. Amen. Isn't that, isn't that a wonderful thought? That when he, He's Lord of my heart and my mind, Lord of my soul, Lord of my sentiment, Lord of my choices and decisions, He's also lording over my adversities and my problems and my situations in life. Amen. Amen. Isn't that a powerful thing? He was high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Let's move on to verse 2. Above it stood seraphim, which had six wings, two covered his face, two covered his feet, two he flew. Next verse. And one cried to the other, say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of holiness. And now, how many, how many feel that if there's anyone in the world that has been selected to preach the holiness of God, it is the church. Yes. yes. Amen. It, it, the church is called on to define God's innate trait, which is holiness. Yes. Jesus said, be ye holy, even as your Father is holy. Be perfect, be holy as God is Lord of hosts, the whole earth is filled, uh, full of his glory. Look at verse 4. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. 
and the house was filled with smoke. Smoke here is not that we need to call 911 and send some fire trucks out, okay? The smoke that he saw here was the smoke, not of judgment, the smoke of the presence of God. Right. That yeah. is the, the awesome um, Shekinah glory of God. Next verse 5. And so I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Yes. Because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And stay there just for a moment. Here, here, here's oh, Brother Curly. This, this, will go, this, will, this, will, this will truck. This will truck. All right? When he sees the Lord on his throne, high and lifted up, and everything that's going on in the house of God, the first thing that happens to his heart, he says, Woe is me. Yeah. For I am undone. One, 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 one of the greatest benefits of having Jesus as Lord of a place, your home, your personal life, your family, your church, especially, and even every aspect of your life, is that God knows how to dissect our hearts. Amen. He knows how to expose our person who we really are. But God does not open us up like in a laboratory just to check to see if we have a pulse. When God opens us up, He exposes us to where the problems are so that we, Him and you, will be able to treat that problem and fix it and it puts us back together again. Somebody asked me this morning about this band-aid I have up here. Again, don't worry, it's, this was not a cause by Diane. Okay, so this is not... Sure. She reminds me all the time that if it was her, it'd be a whole lot worse than that. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> that a small cancer removed from it. You know, basal cell carcinoma is the stuff that from the sun coming into the enemies. When Jesus is Lord of a church, he exposes our weakness. And he brings us into a place of humility. Because we understand that when Christ is Lord of our hearts and lives, we understand the role expectations. He is Lord, I'm the servant. He is the master, I'm the slave. He is the one that leads and directs. I am not the one. And so understand today that when God brings us into his house and something inside of you surfaces as something that needs to be addressed in your life, it is not to embarrass you. It is not to suppress you. It is not to discourage you or cause despondency. But rather, it is there so you can confess the need of Christ in your heart and seek remedy for this situation in your life. This is what it's all about. Amen. He said, I'm, un I'm undone. I'm exposed for who I am. I'm, I'm, I'm unworthy. And how many times I've stepped behind that pulpit and said, I'm not worthy to be right. in this place. Yeah. Right. But by your blood you have That's made right. me worthy. That's right. That's right. And I dwell in the midst, and say, I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. See, here, here's good psychology. I call it Christian psychology. This is a difference. Good Christian psychology. Good, good uh, nuthetic counseling. Where is Natalie? Is she? She can tell. Good nuthetics here. Good nuthetics. Okay? You might want to remember what I'm about to say. When you discover an area of your life that needs attention, remember this. You're not being singled out because you're one of many that need the same treatment. How many know that when you go to the doctor's office, everybody is there because they have a problem? Can you imagine being at the doctor's office and you think you're the only one with a problem? 
What do you think everybody else is there for? <laughs> if they're all sick! Yeah. So, the, the, the wonderful consolation that we have is that if we see evil, if we see something in us that inherently is wrong, don't condemn yourself. Say, I am one among many <laughs> who are facing difficulties of life. Amen. Not only do I have unclean lips, but everybody around me has unclean lips. Amen. Amen. Not one. The not righteous, no, not one, the Bible says. Right. So don't condemn, don't suppress yourself. Understand that you don't stick out like a sore thumb, that you're the worst person in the world, even if you are. No, but anyway, you might that. <laughs> don't think you're the worst person, because if this, I'm, I am dwelling in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Now, he's just pointing out the one thing here. Why is he saying lips? Why is he picking on lips and not toes? Why, why, why is he talking about lips and not hands, fingers, ears, nose? Why is he saying, for my eyes have seen the king. You, you hear, watch now. Watch, oh, oh, oh. Everybody said, this is good stuff. This is this is good. Good. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> For my eyes have seen the king. Now, watch that. The first thing, the first response to the presence of Christ in a congregation is to worship. Yes. 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 So he points out to his uncleanness of lips because I'm not worthy to worship right. from these lips. That's right. Are we picking up on this? Yes. I want to praise the Lord with my my hands are dirty. My lips are unclean. I want to you, you have an immediate sensation a feeling that I want to praise and worship God, but who am I? My lips are not worthy to carry the term holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. For my eyes have seen. So in other words, when you see the King of Kings on his throne, the first thing you want to do is to bow and worship. That's right. right. That's right. And so he said, my lips are unclean. I can't. But there's a remedy. Let's look at verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongues from the altar. <coughs> How many know that when you come to Dr. Jesus, he already has Analyze your problem. Amen. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. He has diagnosed precisely the problem. And thank the Lord, he doesn't have to write a prescription. Amen. He is the prescriber. Amen. Amen. And medicine for us. Yes. That's right. He's the great physician. And in this case, the angel, the seraphim, he took with tongues a coal from the altar of sacrifice and touched his lips. Look at verse 7. <coughs> and he touched my mouth with it and said, this is what the title of the message is today. Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your Amen. sin is cursed. So shall praise the Lord. God knows how to heal a self-condemning soul. 
Amen. He knows how to lift you from where you are and bring you into a place of acceptability in the eyes of God. And that is through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the one that was laid on the altar for us of sacrifice. And those coals are still hot today. Can you say amen? Because the Holy Spirit is the fire from heaven. Jesus said, He will fill you with the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist, He will fill you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Every day when you see yourself in a bad mood about yourself, let the Lord again touch you by the fire of the Holy Spirit. Let Him touch your lips and your heart and your mind so that you you can praise and worship God once again. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad that Christ has a healing and a cleansing 24-7? Yes. Amen. He has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is purged. Now you can say, Holy, Holy, Holy yes. is the Lord God Almighty. He is worthy to be praised.
Huh? Well, I lived in British Columbia. I had two children born in British Columbia, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And that's the salmon capital of the world. There's so much salmon there. Even the cats snub their nose at it. <laughs> when you have cats snubbing their nose at something, you know there's something wrong in the house, okay? When it comes to salmon. Sam and Patty's are a lot cheaper, but what I got was, was the actual. What is that? <laughs> yeah, <there's laughs> huh? Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> if the can stuff knows four bucks. Four bucks, okay, so four bucks. <laughs> yeah. Alright, so <laughs> let's let's bring it into perspective. Two things I want to show you. Very, very important here. Number one. Let's go back to verse one real quick. Listen very, very closely because, you know, the, the flaps when they're down is the most crucial part of the trip. Amen. It's the landing. Okay. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Those of you who have been on an airplane? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you haven't been on an airplane, let me explain to you. The most crucial yep. is takeoff and landing. And so when you get to that landing, you've got to be just right. So I want you to pay attention. Watch now. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Listen closely. Point number one. Before you can see Christ, something has to die. Amen. Something has to die. It's true that God loves us just like we are, but He loves us too much to leave us. The year King Uzziah. Now, now what is it? Was it? It was King Uzziah. I mean, you know. By the way, listen, listen. Do you know what his fault was? Do you know what his biggest sin was? How do you know and understand? In Old Testament times, the difference between the king ruling in the nation of Israel and the priest ruling over the temple is that the king was disallowed to touch anything in that temple. Right. Only the priests were consecrated to handle the things in the temple. The king was not permitted. Uzziah's sin was that he went in and mingled with the priest's material, the things, the artifacts. Mm -hmm. He had no business touching that altar of incense. He had no business going into the holy place and dealing with any of that stuff. It caused his death because that's not his place. Listen closely. Watch now. This is where you we get the rubber hitting the <laughs> pavement landing here. Watch now. Anything in your life that dominates your life, that interferes with your priesthood in terms of worshiping God, you need to die this morning. Right? Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Did y'all get that? Amen. King Uzziah must die. <coughs> then you're going to see a whole lot. Yeah. Amen. King Uzziah must die. Something has to die. There may not be king tuck in your life anywhere. But anything that dominates your thinking, your habits, your way of life, that governs your behavior, your comportment, that governs your activities of life and your decisions and choices, anything that dominates that over the Holy Spirit must die. Amen. Amen. Yes. If you want to see the Lord. Yes. That could be tradition. Right. Culture. Yes. Southern or otherwise. Amen. <laughs> Learned behaviors. These are dominating factors. You can also have in there. Philosophies of this world ungodly yeah. ideologies and philosophies 
and agendas that we espouse because we're so inundated every single day by the social media that we begin to think like the world. Right. And we don't even read enough of the Word of God That's to right. be able to be influenced that we could think the thoughts of God. That's right. That's right. So Paul said, who has the mind of God? We do, he said. God has given us access to have the mind of God to Amen. think the yes. thoughts of God. Yeah. Amen. But we're so inundated with the social media, TV, radio, ads, everything. And the political arena, that's all we hear. So we are influenced in our values to establish value systems. When we must come back to God, come back to Christ, come back to the Holy Spirit, come back to the church. Come back to worship and see Christ high and lifted up and allow the Holy Spirit to take those tongues from the from the, 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 the uh, hot coals of the altar and touch our hearts, our lips, our conscience. Yes. The lips here would be the conscience. Your yes. soul yes. needs to be touched. That's the first thing. It has to die. Something, is, can you identify something in your life this morning Amen. that you feel needs to die? Needs to die. We have this cross up here that Paul says that in Galatians, chapter 5 and chapter 6 both, and Colossians, that they that are Christ's have nailed the flesh, crucified the flesh on the cross, Jesus Christ. If you have something in your life that needs to be nailed to the cross, do it this morning before you eat. We have nails, we have, we have the marker, and we've got the hammer. See all those rags up there? These are people over the years that have come up and nailed those problems, those kings of Uzziahs in life, and say, I don't want this anymore. And I'm going to nail that thing to the cross. Amen. Nail. To pr protect your privacy, you simply put your first name on it, and this King Uzziah thing. Say, I'm, I'm going to break this. And nail it to the cross. And when you're tempted again, say, no, I, I got you nailed. nailed. I nailed you. Mm -hmm. I nailed you. You're done. And by doing this, you now have a point of reference. And when you're tempted or challenged, you can always make that reference. I remember. I nailed it. This no longer governs me. The second part of this is the touching of our lips. The third part, and I'm closing with this now, is getting on the runway right now. It's coming to us preaching now. <laughs> is that you'll be able to say, Lord, send me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Send me. Because yeah. you'll have a message. You will have a message. Praise this Lord. world needs to hear. Would you bow your hearts with Lord Jesus, we thank you for your mercy, your grace, your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you're blessing us, Father, beyond measure. And we're saying, 